Hello everyone. Here I welcome you all to yet another tech enthusiastic video from Edureka. Today we will be learning Java from scratch. Before we begin, please subscribe to Edureka YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update on the trending technologies in 2020. Also, if you're looking for an online certification in Java, then check out the link in the description box below. Let us take a quick peek on the agenda for today's discussion. We shall begin with Java basics where we will learn about a little history of Java and the basics of Java such as control statements, loop statements, data types, variables and many more. Followed by that we shall step into the object oriented programming style in Java which includes the object oriented programming concepts such as encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance and polymorphism. Followed by that we shall enter into some advanced programming concepts in Java such as function overloading, function overriding, exception handling, multi-threading and many more. Now that we are clear with the agenda, let us begin with our session for today. There are many controversies that say Java is going to die and it has become weak compared to its competitors. So many beginners and experienced programmers have a doubt if it's really dying. To clear this doubt, let us have a quick look on the major applications and websites once. Airbnb, Uber, Facebook, Instagram, Google, Amazon, Netflix and lot many. We shall begin with little basic history of Java. Now, why did we recall all these applications and websites? It is because all these tech giants are in the use of none other than Java programming language. It is the base of all data frames, storage and parts of every single major application. This entirely proves that Java is never going to die. It is getting evolved every single day and it is one of the major reasons behind the development of much major softwares. Now that we have a good clarification, let us move ahead and learn Java really fast. Java is also used in multiple ways for example social media, big data and Hadoop, Android application development, data science and artificial intelligence, data security, software testing and data analytics. Now that we have a good clarification, let us move ahead and learn Java really fast. We shall begin with a little basic and history of Java. Firstly, history of Java. Java was invented by James Gosling in the year 1995. It was basically invented for interactive television. For God's sake, it was found too advanced and was also able to perform extraordinary and sizable tasks than just a television thing. They found it had some impeccable features as well. Now, let us move ahead and discuss some of those features as well. Some of the major features are as follows. Firstly, Open source. Java, since its birth till today, is an open source product. There are many speculations that say Java is not free anymore. But to be sure, Java is still free. And the OpenJDK and Oracle JDK are completely similar to each other. That means you can type your code using Oracle JDK and execute it in OpenJDK. And the JDK versions are also available for all the types of operating systems such as Windows, Linux, Mac and many other flavors of Linux. Followed by the first feature, the next feature is high performance. Java is an interpreted language. So it will never be as fast as a compiled language like C or C++ but Java enables high performance with the use of just in time compiler. So here Java provides us high performance. Followed by that, the next feature is multi-threading. Java multi-threading feature makes it possible to write a program that can do many tasks simultaneously. The benefit of multi-threading is that it utilizes the same memory and other resources to execute multiple threads at the same time like while typing, grammatical errors are checked along. Followed by this feature, the fourth feature is secure. When it comes to security, Java is always the first choice. With Java secure features, it enables us to develop virus-free and tamper-free systems. Java program always runs in a Java runtime environment 
with almost null interaction with host operating system. Hence, it is most secure. Followed by this, the next feature is Java's platform independency. Unlike other programming languages such as C or C++, etc., which are compiled into platform specific machines. Java is guaranteed to be right once run anywhere language. On compilation, Java program is compiled into bytecode. This bytecode is platform independent and can be run on any machine. Plus, this bytecode format also provides security. Any machine with Java runtime environment can run Java programs. Followed by this, the next feature is portability. The cross platform feature enables the Java code to be highly portable. In Java, everything is an object which has some data and behavior. Java can be easily extended as it is based on object oriented programming model. The last but not the least feature of Java is its robust nature. Java makes an effort to eliminate error prone codes by emphasizing mainly on compile time error checking and runtime error checking. But the main areas in which Java improvised were memory management and mishandle exceptions by introducing automatic garbage collector and exception handling. Now let us enter into the installation process. We shall now install Java into the local system. Our local system will be Windows. To download Java, just Google Java download for Windows operating system. You will be redirected to a new web page and from here you can select Java SE downloads Oracle technology network Oracle link to download Java for your local system. And now you will be redirected into a new page where you will be shown the Oracle JDK platform 13. Select the download button which is shown here in the blue color. Now you will be redirected into the next web page where you can select the version which can match your particular local system. For us, we should be downloading the Oracle JDK version for Windows. Just select accept license agreement and click on the version you need to download for your local system and it's done. You can see that the JDK version for Windows is getting downloaded. Once after the JDK is downloaded into your local system, enter into the system settings and type in edit environment variables. There you can see this particular icon is what we need, which is edit environment variables for your account. Select the environment variables and you can see this dialog box. And in this dialog box, create a new variable, which will be the Java home variable for your JDK. Type in Java home and inside this second dialog box, you need to add in the location of your Java's bin file. As you can see, the location of my Java JDK is this. So you can just copy this particular path and go back to the edit environment variable dialog box and place in this value and just select OK to save it. As you can see, I have already set my Java path. So I would prefer to cancel, but you have to select OK. Once after you set the Java home, you need to set the path for your JDK. The path to the JDK can be set using the path select option from the edit environment variables. Just select path and select edit option and you will be shown with a new dialog box. And in here, you need to select the path to your Java file. You can set the Java path by selecting bin and copying the path. You can see the path to my JDK is C program files Java JDK and bin. Copy this path and paste in the edit environment variable path file. As you can see, I have my JDK path already set, which is C program files Java JDK bin. 
After this, just select OK. As I have already set my path, I would prefer to select Cancel, but you have to select OK. Once after your path is set, select OK and close the Edit Environment Variables properties or your system properties. Now that Java JDK has been installed into your local system, let us check the version of Java which is existing in your system. So, to check the Java version in your system, just open your command prompt. Once after the command prompt is open, just type in Java C. So, if you get this on your command prompt, then it is sure that Java has been successfully installed into your system. Yet, we can also check the version of Java that is installed onto our local system. To do so, we can type in Java space hyphen version and press enter. You can see that the Java version installed into our local system is Java 1.8. Now, we have got Java installed into our system successfully. To run Java, we might need one of the popular IDEs such as Eclipse, IntelliJ and many more. To execute our programs, we shall select Eclipse IDE. To install Eclipse into a local system, just type in Eclipse download on Google. Once after you type in and enter Eclipse download, you will be redirected to a new web page where you will find many links and you should select the first link which will redirect you into the Eclipse Foundation. And in here, you're supposed to download Eclipse IDE 2019-12 installer file. And you can see your installer file is getting downloaded. You can see that Eclipse installation file has been successfully downloaded into your local system. Now, you just need to open the file. Now you can see multiple options of Eclipse IDE such as Eclipse IDE for Java developers, IDE for enterprise Java developers, IDE for C or C++ developers and many more. Now we shall prefer IDE for enterprise Java developers. Now you have got yourself redirected into a new dialog box and here you've been asked for install option. Just select install and Eclipse IDE will be installed into your local system. I already have an Eclipse IDE installed in my local system, so I would prefer to go back, but you should select install to install it into your local system. Once after you install the Eclipse IDE into your local system, you shall see something like this. So inside the Eclipse IDE, to create a new file in the Eclipse IDE, you need to select file option and inside file, you need to select new and inside new, select new Java project and there you go. You'll be redirected into a new dialog box where you should enter the name for your project. Let us enter Edureka. Followed by that, finish. Your project has been successfully created. Now, select your project and right click on it. Or click the drop down menu and you can see a source file. Select the source file and right click the source file and now create a new package. The name of your package will be set as Edureka by default, which is your project name. Just select finish to create a new package. Once after you create a new package, just select the package and right click and select new to create a new class. Now name your class. The class name can be anything. For now, let us write in hello. And after that, you can also select in public static void main as default. And after that, just finish. And there you go, your new class has been successfully created. Now, let's go back to our presentation. You can see that we have successfully installed Java. Now, let us try to execute a simple hello world program in our Eclipse IDE and see if our Java and Eclipse are working fine together or not. 
So here you can see that this is our first program and inside this we are trying to just print hello world message. Now to run the code you need to select all the code and select the run icon which is placed on your tools bar. So this particular bar is your tools bar and inside which you can see a green button which says run my first Java program. Just select it and you can see this dialog box and inside this you need to select OK which says save and launch. Your application has got successfully launched and you can see the hello world message has been successfully printed on the console. Now that we have successfully executed our first Java program, let's move ahead and understand the variables in Java. First, let us understand the basic definition of a variable. A variable is a container that holds the value while Java program is being executed. A variable is assigned with a data type. Variable is the name of the memory location and there are three types of variables in Java which are local, instance and static. Let us understand local variable. A variable declared inside the body of a method is called local variable. You can use this variable only within that particular method and other methods in the class will not be aware of that particular variables which are used in your local class. A local variable cannot be defined with the static keyword. Followed by that we have instance variable. A variable declared inside the class but outside the body of the method is called instance variable. It is not declared as static. It is called the instant variable because its value is instance specific and not shared among other instances. The last but not the least is the static variable. A variable which can be declared as static is called static variable. It cannot be local. You can create a single copy of static variable and share among all the instances of the class. Memory allocation for static variable happens only once when the class is loaded in the memory. Now the next part is the data types. The data types supported in Java programming language are int, float, double, long, short, character, byte and boolean. Now let us also go through the size of each data type supported by Java. Java supports two bytes for integer data type. 4 bytes for float data type, 8 bytes for double and 8 bytes for long. Followed by that 2 bytes for character type data type, 1 byte for short, 1 for byte and 1 byte for boolean. These data types are called as primitive data types. Followed by variables and data types. Now let us enter into the operators that are available in Java. The operators in a programming language are specific or special symbols used along with the variables or numbers so as to carry out some specific operations. The various operators available in Java are as follows. They are unary operator, arithmetic operator, shift operator, relational operator, bitwise operator, logical operator, ternary operator and finally the assignment operator. We shall discuss about each and every single operator available in Java. Firstly, the unary operator. The Java unary operator requires only one operand. The unary operators are used to perform various operations such as incrementing or decrementing a value by one, negating an expression, inverting the value of a boolean and many more. Now, let us execute a simple example of unary operator in Java. As you can see, this particular example is based on unary operators. So here I have declared a value 10 to the variable x of integer data type. And now I am trying to increment the value of x by 1 by adding the unary operator increment. This particular incrementation is called post increment. Followed by that, we have a similar increment operator which is placed before x which says it is a pre-increment operator. Followed by that we will try to decrement the value of x by 1 by using post decrement operator where we will provide the decrement operator after x. And similarly the same decrement operator is used before x 
which says that it is a predetermined operation. Now let us try to execute our program and see the output. You can see the output has been successfully generated. Now followed by this, let us move ahead and understand the automatic operator. Java automatic operators are used to perform addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. They act as basic mathematic operations. Now let us see a basic example for automatic operators. You can see I have provided two variables that is A and B. A has the value 10 and B has the value 5. So the basic automatic operations that I will be performing are addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and modulus. So the addition symbol is carried out by plus, subtraction is minus, multiplication is star, division is forward slash and modulus is modulus symbol. These are common. Now let us execute this and see the output. You can see all the automatic operations have been successfully executed and the output is also generated. So you can see the addition is 15, subtraction is 5, multiplication is 50, division is 2 and modulus is 0. Now with this, let us move ahead into the next type of operators which are none other than the shift operators. The shift operator is used to shift the bits in the value to the left or right side of the specific number of times. We have two types of shift operators which are left shift operator and the right shift operator. The left shift operator moves the specific number of bits towards the left side and the right shift towards the right side. Now let us execute a sample program to understand the shift operators in a much better way. You can see I have used shift operator here which is left shift and I'm using left shift operator to move 2 bits of 10 towards left side and 3 bits of 10 towards left side and 2 bits of 20 towards left side and 4 bits of 15 towards left side. So basically what happens here is 10 will be converted into binary numbers and similarly all the other numbers will be converted into binary numbers and the number of bits which we require that is 2 will be shifted in that particular converted binary number and the new number generated will be provided in decimal numbers and that will be our output. Let us execute this program and see our output. You can see that the program has been getting executed and the new numbers have been generated here as the output. So 10 after shifting 2 bits towards left will be generating 40 and 10 after shifting 3 bits towards left will generate 80 and similarly 15 after shifting 4 bits will generate in 240. Now that we have understood the shift operator, let us move ahead and understand the relational operator. The Java relational operator is used to compare the operands on both the sides of the relational operator. This particular operator judge whether one of the operands is greater or lesser or equal or not equal to the other operator. Now, the basic operation what a relational operator does is it compares the two numbers. For example, if you have a as 5 and b as 10 and if you compare if a is greater than b then the result will be false because a is smaller than b. So this is what a relational operator basically does. Now let us go through a sample program to understand relational operators in a much better way. Here you can see that I have declared three variables that is a, b and c. a has 10, b has 5 and c has 20. Now what we are doing is we are comparing a is less than b and a is less than c and followed by that we are comparing again a is less than b and a is less than c. So this example is both for relational operator as well as logical operator. So the logical operation which we have used is AND. Now let us try to execute this program and see the output. And there you go. The result is false because A is greater than B but not less than B. Similarly, A is less than C. But the result of AND logical operator is false 
because to become true both sides of the operand should be true now let us move ahead and understand bitwise operator basically the bitwise operator is applied on the bits for example if we provide a number to the variable that particular number will be converted into binary format and after that the operation will be applied on the bits one by one let us execute a sample program to understand bitwise operators in a much better way so this particular example is based on bitwise operators here also we have the same three values that is a is equals to 10 b is equals to 5 and c is equals to 20. now we're performing bitwise operations on the particular variables and comparing them using a logical operator which is and now let us try to execute this program and see the output you can see that the program has been successfully executed and the output has been printed but the value of a has been changed here from 10 to 11. this happened because it is based on the bitwise operation which we performed here that is a plus plus post increment now followed by this let us move ahead and understand the next type of operators that are the logical operators the logical operators are the operators which are applied on both the ends or both the operands so the basic logical operators supported in java programming language are and or and not the and operator is used to perform logical operation on two operands and it will result in a boolean result so to become a true boolean result and should be having both the operands as true and in or to result a true value either one of the operands should be true and when it comes to not not is just a simple logical operator which negates the existing value that means if the value is true then after the not operation the value will be converted into false now let us see one basic example to understand logical operators in a much better way you can see the previous example is the best fit to understand logical operators you can see the value here was false since a is greater than b so this value will result in a false and this value will result in false so false and false will result in false now moving ahead we shall understand the next type of operators which are the ternary operators the ternary operator is simple but highly powerful operator used in java programming language this particular ternary operator will reduce the code length to one line to understand this in a much better way let us execute a sample program here you can see that we have two different values which are a and b a has two and b has five so the ternary operator is this particular statement here we have also allocated a new variable which is of integer type which is minimum so minimum is equals to a less than b if a is less than b then minimum is a and else b is equals to minimum so this particular operation is minimum here a is compared if a is truly less than b then a will be printed into minimum else b will be printed into minimum and finally we shall print the value which is stored into minimum now let us execute this and see the output you can see that the value of a which is 2 has been printed here after executing the ternary operator present in the line number 7 now let us move ahead and understand the next type of operators which are the assignment operators the assignment operators used in java programming language are simply used to allocate the resultant memory into the variable which is located in the left side of the operand the basic assignment operators used in java programming language are equals to and double equals to to understand assignment operators in a much better way let us execute a sample java program so this particular program is based on assignment operations here we have two different values which are a and b a is equals to 10 and b is equals to 20. now what we are basically doing here is using the assignment operator and adding value 4 to the value 10 and decrementing value 4 to the value 20. this particular operator used here is the assignment operator now the result will be a is equals to 14 and b is equals to 16. 
Now let us execute this program and see if the output will be correct or not. You can see the output is as expected. With this, let us move ahead and understand the control statements in Java. A control statement in Java is a statement that determines whether the other statement will be executed or not. In simple terms, it controls the flow of a particular program in Java. Now, let us see the control statements which are present in Java. So the control statements supported in Java are if else loop, while loop, do while loop, for loop and switch case. So these are the basic control statements that each and every programmer must be known with. Now, let us understand each and every one of these control statements and also execute a basic program to understand them in a much better way. Firstly, we shall deal with the if statement or if control statement. In this statement, if the condition specified is true, the if block will be executed. Otherwise, the else block will be executed. We shall execute a sample program to understand the if else statement in a much better way. So this particular program is based on if else control statement. Here, we have the input a is equals to 15. The first if condition will be in case if a is greater than 20, then the first printf statement should be executed. Else, the other printf statement should be executed. Now, let us execute this program and see the output. Since we know 15 is less than 20, we should be expecting the second set of statements to be executed, which is a is less than 10 and hello world. You can see the message has been successfully printed here. Followed by this, let us move ahead and understand the next type of control statements which are supported in Java, that is none other than the while loop. Known as the most common loop, the while loop evaluates a certain condition. If the condition is true, then the code is executed. The process is continued until the specific condition turns out to be false. The condition to be specified in while loop must be a Boolean expression. An error will be generated if the type is used is not an integer type or a string type. Let us execute a basic example to understand this while loop in a much better way. As you can see, this particular example is based on while loop. Here, we have a variable i which has the value 5. Here, the condition specified in while loop is i should be less than or equal to 15. Until then, we have to execute the printf statement which prints the value of i. And after that, the value of i will be incremented by 2. Now, this particular set of loop will be executed until the value of i is less than or equal to 15. Once after this condition becomes true, the loop will be terminated. Let us try to execute this program and see the output. You can see the values 5, 7, 9, 11, 13 and 15 are printed successfully. Once after the value of i reached to 15, the loop got terminated and it exited the loop. Now followed by this, let us understand the next type of loop which is the do while loop. The do while loop is completely similar to the while loop. The only difference is that the condition of the do while loop is evaluated after the execution of the loop body. This guarantees that the loop is executed at least once. Now, let us try to execute a sample program to understand do while loop in a much better way. You can see that this particular example is based on do while loop. Here, we have a variable i which stores the value 20. So, once after the value is been declared, we have the do while loop. So inside the do while loop, we are supposed to print the value of i. The value of i will be incremented by 1 every single time the loop is executed. Now the loop body of do while loop is finished. So the condition is placed at the end of do while loop, which says the i value should be less than or equal to 20. Until then, this particular loop is valid. Now the only suspense between do while loop and while loop is the do while loop will be executed at least for once without checking the condition because the condition is placed after the do loop body. Now let us try to execute this and see the output. 
you can see that the while loop has been successfully executed. The value 20 is printed only for once because the value of i which we declared was 20 and it is true according to the condition. So the control got terminated. Let us move ahead and understand the next type of loop which is the for loop. The for loop in Java is used to iterate and evaluate a code multiple times. When the number of iterations is known by the user, it is recommended to use the for loop. To understand the for loop in a much better way, let us try to execute one basic example based on for loop. So this particular example is based on for loop. Here we have the value of i as 1 and the condition is i is less than or equal to 10 and after that a post increment. So in this particular statement, we will be printing the value of i 10 times until the for loop is true. The three basic parts of a for loop are declaration, condition and increment or decrement. So this particular first block which is i is equals to 1 is the declaration part and after that i is less than or equal to 10 is the condition part and lastly i plus plus which is the increment is the last part. Now let us try to execute this program and see the output. You can see that the program has been successfully executed and the value of i is printed for 10 times which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 and 10. Now followed by this, let us understand the next type of loop which is the switch case. A switch statement in Java is used to execute a single statement for multiple conditions. The switch case statement can be used with short byte int, long enum types etc. Certain points must be noted while using the switch statement which are one or n number of case values can be specified for a switch expression. Case values that are duplicate are not permissible. A compile time error is generated by the compiler if unique values are not used. Next, the case value must be a literal or a constant. Variables are not permissible. The last condition is usage of break statement is made to terminate the statement sequence. It is optional to use this statement. If the statement is not specified, the next case is automatically executed. Now, let us try to execute a sample program to understand switch case in a much better way. You can see that this particular program is based on switch statement. The switch condition is instrument. Now here, the condition is that we are supposed to select the instrument number 4 which happens to be flute. Now we have a various set of instruments present in our case which are piano, drums, guitar, flute, ukulele, violin and lastly the default statement which is invalid. Let us try to execute this program and see the output. Since we have provided our selection to be 4 which happens to be flute, the output should be directly generated as flute. Now let us run this and see the output. You can see that the program has been successfully generated and the selected instrument flute has been displayed in the console. Now moving ahead, we shall understand the object oriented style of programming in Java. Object oriented programming is a programming style which is associated with programming concepts such as inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction and encapsulation. Most of the popular programming languages like Java, C++, Ruby etc follow an object oriented programming paradigm. As Java being the most sought after skill, we will talk about object oriented programming concepts in Java. An object based application in Java is based on declaring classes, creating objects from them and interacting between these objects. The first object oriented programming style we will be discussing today is encapsulation. Encapsulation is a mechanism where you bind your data and code together as a single unit. It also means to hide your data in order to make it safe from any modification. What does this mean? The best way to understand encapsulation is to look at the example of a medical capsule where the drug is always safe inside the capsule. Similarly, through encapsulation, the methods and variables of a class will be hidden safe. To understand encapsulation in a much better way, let us go through a simple example. So this particular program is the example for encapsulation. Here 
we have encapsulated the data members which are the name of the user which is Ravi and account number of the user and email of the user and the amount which is present in the particular user's account. Now we will try to execute this program and print the details of the user. You can see the program has been successfully executed and the account number of the user has been displayed here along with his name and mail ID along with the balance amount which is present in his particular account. So this particular example was based on encapsulation. Now let us move ahead and understand the next type of object oriented programming style which is inheritance. As we can see in the image a child inherits the properties from his father. Similarly in Java there are two classes. They are parent class which is also called as a super class or a base class. And the next type of class is a child class which is also called as a subclass or a derived class. A class which inherits the properties is known as a child class whereas the class whose properties are inherited is known as the parent class. Inheritance in Java is further classified into four types. They are single inheritance, multi-level inheritance, hierarchical inheritance and lastly the hybrid inheritance. The first one single inheritance. In single inheritance one class inherits the properties of another. It enables a derived class to inherit the properties and behavior from a single parent class. This will in turn enable code usability as well as add new features to the existing code. Here class A is your parent class and class B is your child class which inherits the properties and behavior from the parent class. Followed by that we have multi-level inheritance. When a child class is derived from a parent class which happens to be also derived from another parent class that is a class having more than one parent class but at different levels. Such type of inheritance is known as multi-level inheritance. If we talk about the flowchart class B inherits the properties and behaviors of class A and class C inherits the properties of class B. So here class A is the parent class of class B as well as class C. So in this case class C implicitly inherits the properties and methods of class A along with the class B. This is what we call is a multi-level inheritance. Followed by this we have hierarchical inheritance. When a class has more than one child class or subclasses in other words more than one child class have the same parent class then such type of inheritance is known as hierarchical. If we talk about the flowchart then class B and class C are the child classes that are inherited from the same parent class that is class A. Followed by that the last type of inheritance is called the hybrid inheritance. The hybrid inheritance is a combination of multiple inheritance and multi-level inheritance. Since multiple inheritance is not supported in Java it leads to ambiguity. This type of inheritance can be only achieved through interfaces. We shall execute examples for each one of the type of inheritances. The first example that we will be executing is based on single inheritance. So in this particular example we have the parent class as teacher and the child class as Hadoop teacher. So here what we are trying to do is we are trying to inherit the properties of the parent class teacher into the child class Hadoop teacher. Let us try to execute this program and see the output. You can see that the program has been successfully executed and the properties of the parent class have been successfully inherited into the child class that is the college name, designation of the teacher and the main subject which he or she will be teaching. Now followed by this we shall try to execute the next type of example based on inheritance. Repeat. So the next type of inheritance is the multi-level inheritance. This particular example is based on multi-level inheritance where one child class inherits the properties of multiple parents at different levels. One happens to be the first class, two happens to be the next class and lastly three happens to be the last child class which extends the properties of one and two. Let us try to execute this program and see the output. You can see that the program has been successfully executed and the output has been successfully generated on the console. Edureka, happy learning. Followed by this, 
we shall move ahead and understand the next type of inheritance. So this particular example is based on hierarchical inheritance where two or more classes inherit the properties of one parent class. So here the class one happens to be the parent class and class two and three are the child classes which are inheriting the properties from the same parent class which happens to be one. Let us try to execute this program and see the output. You can see that the program has been successfully executed and the output has been generated which says Edureka happy learning. Now we have discussed all the three inheritances which are single level inheritance, multi-level inheritance and hierarchical inheritance. The last type of inheritance which happens to be multiple inheritance or hybrid inheritance happens to be not supported in Java. To make this happen, Java has come up with a new idea which is called as interface. So we shall discuss about Java interfaces in the further chapters. So the next concept in object oriented style of programming is the abstraction. Abstraction refers to the quality of dealing with ideas rather than events. It basically deals with hiding the details and showing the essential things to the user. If you look at the image here, whenever you get a call, we get an option either to pick it up or just to reject it. But in reality, there is a lot of code that runs in the background. So we don't know the internal processing of how a call is generated. That's the beauty of the abstraction. Therefore, abstraction helps to reduce the code complexity. You can achieve abstraction in two ways. That is by using an abstraction class or an interface. We shall understand abstract classes first. An abstract class in Java contains abstract keyword. What does the abstract keyword mean? If a class is declared abstract, it cannot be instantiated, which means you cannot create an object of an abstract class. Also, an abstract class can contain abstract as well as concrete methods. Now followed by that, the next one is an interface. Interface in Java is known as a blueprint of a class or you can say it is a collection of abstract methods and static constraints. In interface, each method is public and abstract but does not contain any constructor. Along with abstraction, interface also helps you to achieve multiple inheritance in Java. We shall execute one single example for each one of these to understand abstraction in a much better way. So the first example that we will be executing will be based on abstraction and the abstract class which is declared here is person. So to declare this particular class, we have used the keyword abstract. So this particular abstract class consists of the following segments. The first one is the name of the person, gender of the person. After this, we have the class which inherits or extends this particular abstract class which is student. So inside student, we have a variable called as student ID which is declared as private. Now the elements from the abstract class will be extended into this particular student class and the output will be generated. So let us execute this program and see the output. You can see the program got successfully executed and the output is being generated. Here we have the name of the student as Priya and gender female. Similarly, Karan, Kumari, John and their genders and also their degrees. Karan, Kumari and John are pursuing engineering and Priya is not studying. So now let's move ahead and understand interfaces in Java. This particular example is based on interface and here the interface that we have declared is about a basic calculating functions which are add, subtract, multiplication and divide. So here we have declared the interface using the keyword interface and as you can see we don't have any constructors inside this interface and followed by this, this is our main class which is student which will implement the interface match to perform the addition, subtraction, multiplication and division operations. Let us try to execute this program and see the output. Now you can see the program got successfully executed and now the program is asking us to enter any two digits to perform addition. Let us enter 10 and 20 and you can see the sum has been successfully generated. Now it is asking values to enter to perform subtraction. Let us enter 10 and 5. You can see the output as 5. Now it is asking for values to perform multiplication. Let us enter 10 and 20. You can see the product as 200 and finally the division operation. Let's enter 20 and 5. 
you can see the quotient is 4. So this is how interface works. Now followed by this. The fourth and last type of object oriented programming style is none other than the polymorphism. Polymorphism means taking many forms where poly means many and morph means forms. It is the ability of a variable function or an object to take on multiple forms. In other words, polymorphism allows you to define one interface or method and have multiple implementations. Polymorphism in Java is of two types. First, runtime polymorphism and compile time polymorphism. In Java, runtime polymorphism refers to a process in which a call to an overridden method is resolved at runtime rather than at compile time. In this, a reference variable is used to call an overridden method of a superclass at runtime. Method overriding is an example of runtime polymorphism. We shall understand method overriding and method overloading in the further concepts that is the advanced Java programming concepts and followed by that we have the next compile time polymorphism. In Java, compile time polymorphism refers to a process in which a call to an overloaded method is resolved at compile time rather than at runtime. Method overloading is an example for compile time polymorphism. Method overloading is a feature that allows a class to have two or more methods having the same name but with different arguments passed to the methods are different. Unlike method overriding, arguments can differ in number of parameters passed to the method, data types of the parameters, sequence of data types when passed to a method. With this, we come to an end of object-oriented style of programming in Java. Now, let us continue with advanced Java concepts. The first amongst the advanced concepts in Java is exception handling. So first of all, what is an exception? An exception is an unwanted or unexpected event which occurs during the execution of a program at runtime that disrupts the normal flow of the program instructions. Error versus exception. Error. An error indicates serious problem that a reasonable application should not try to catch. Whereas, exception indicates conditions that are reasonable to an application that might try or to catch. Now, how does the JVM handle exception? There is a method called default exception handling whenever inside a method if an exception is occurred. The method creates an object known as exception object and hands it off to the runtime system that is JVM. The exception objects contain name and description of the exception and the current state of the program where the exception has occurred. So this is how the exception is handled. Let us try to execute a simple program based on exception handling to understand it in a much better way. So this particular example is based on exception handling in Java. So this particular program is related to divide by zero exception where the given number will be divided by zero. So anything cannot be divided by zero. So this particular exception is called as divide by zero exception and we cannot divide any number by zero. Let us run this program and see the output. You can see that the program has been successfully executed and the output has been generated which says can't divide it by zero. Now moving ahead, the next advanced Java concept is multi-threading. Multi-threading in Java is a feature that allows concurrent execution of two or more parts of a program for maximum utilization of CPU. Each part of such a program is called as thread. Threads are lightweight processes within a same process. Now, let us try to execute a sample program to understand multi-threading in a better way. Now, this particular example is based on multi-threading in Java. We'll be creating multiple threads like one or two and we will be seeing if that particular thread is existing and running or not. Now let's try to execute this program and see the output. Don't worry about the codes, we will send you at your request if you provide your mail ID. Now you can see threads are created here. Thread 1 and thread 2 have got created and thread 1 is running. Thread 2 is getting started and also thread 2 is also running. Now you can see the functionalities of thread 1 and thread 2 and they are existing safely. Now with this, let us move ahead into the next concept which is call by value and call by reference in Java. Call by value and call by reference in Java is just function calling. Firstly, call by value means calling a method or a function with the parameter as value. Through this method, the argument value is passed to the parameter while 
On the other hand, call by reference means calling a method with a parameter as a reference, which is the address of the value. Let us execute one example each to understand them in a better way. So this particular example is based on call by value method. Here we will be providing the values of A and B and call the function swap. So this particular function is based on swapping the values between A and B. So the values of A is 30 and the value of B is 45. So after calling this swap function, the values of A and B will be swapped. Now let's execute this program and see the output. As you can see, the program has been successfully executed and before swapping the values were 30 and 45. Now the values are exchanged. Now with this, let us move ahead and execute an example based on call by reference. So this particular example is based on call by reference. We are performing the same swap function here, but here we are providing the address of the values. Now let's run this program and see the output. You can see the program has been executed and the values have been successfully swapped. Now let us move ahead and understand the next advanced programming concept in Java that is method overloading and method overriding. Method overloading is a feature that allows a class to have more than one method having the same name if their arguments lists are different. It is similar to constructor overloading in Java that allows a case to have more than one constructor having different arguments list. Now let us execute a sample program to understand method overloading in Java. So this particular example is based on method overloading in Java. Here we have two different methods on the same name. The name is add and the first method is having only two variables and the second method is having three variables. Now let us try to call these functions and see the output. You can see both the functions have been executed and the sum has been displayed in the output console here. So this was method overloading. Now let us move ahead and understand method overriding in Java. In any object oriented programming language, overriding is a feature that allows a subclass or a child class to provide a specific implementation of a method that is already provided by one of its superclasses or parent classes. Method overriding is one of the major way in which Java can achieve runtime polymorphism. Now, this particular example is based on method overriding. Here, we have two different functions. So the first function is in the parent class, which is move, and the second function is with the same name, which is move, that is existing in the child class, that is dog. Both these methods are implemented in the main class, and the functionalities of both the methods are included in the main class. Now let's try to execute this program and see the output. As you can see, the program has been successfully executed and the output has been generated. Apart from this, Edureka offers Java J2EE and SOA certification training. Edureka is the segment leader in providing the best in class live instructor led training on Java technology and it is provided by industry level experts with years of real time experience in the technology. The salient features of Edureka Java training are instructor led sessions. So in instructor led sessions, you will be having about 42 hours of online live instructor led classes and followed by that you will be dealing with real life case studies which will have a live project based on any of the selected use cases. So followed by real life case studies, you will be having assignments after each and every class where you'll get a chance to apply the concepts learned. Followed by that, you will be having a lifetime access to the learning management system. And also, you have 24-7 expert support if you have any doubts after the class. Once after you complete your course, Edureka certifies you as an SOA Java developer based on the project reviewed by your expert panel and this particular certificate has been recognized by many multinational companies. Now with this we come to an end of this particular Java tutorial. I hope you had a sound briefing of the basic concepts in Java and if you have any queries related to this particular session then please write them down in the comment section below and till then thank you and a very happy learning. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!